If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know how excited I get when I have guests on who talk about water and its relationship to consciousness, health, and the nature of reality. In this episode, I speak with Dr. Mauro Zapatera, MD, PhD, to explore the relationship between fourth phase water, cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, consciousness, the soul, kundalini yoga, God, and so much more. CSF is a fluid that surrounds and cushions the brain and spinal cord, playing a crucial role in their function. But according to Dr. Zapatera and his work, the purpose and importance of CSF is likely beyond anything we're told. I know I've said this a lot on this podcast, and I don't want to be the boy who cries wolf and like says something so much that it loses all of its meaning, but I, I genuinely mean when I say this. This is one of my favorite episodes I think I've ever recorded. Um... I've said this a lot on the show too. Anytime I say wow a ton, it's likely a good sign. And I found myself having to mute myself for the amount of times I was saying wow, so I wouldn't interrupt Dr. Zabatera. But again, exploring water and its relationship to health and the nature of reality and everything just blows my mind. Um, but this is taking it to another level because it is a mostly water-based substance that we're referring to, but it's something that is is foundational to our health and likely foundational to our metaphysical health and connection to God, the creator. It th This conversation was incredible, like <laughs> incredible. Um, so the first hour is just Dr. Zapater and I going back and forth with each other on all things related to cerebral spinal fluid, kind of covering his journey, um, getting into this space. And then the last hour is a presentation that he gave. So if you're listening to this on audio, you should be able to follow along pretty well, but I definitely recommend watching the video version at least for the last hour. And you will be blown away by this conversation. Dr. Mauro Zapatera obtained his MD and PhD from Harvard Medical School. He is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation with a focus on optimizing human performance, increasing awareness, and decreasing suffering. So that's just a small piece of his full bio and credentials and all the amazing work that he's doing. So please be sure to check the show notes to learn more about Dr. Mario Zapatera, especially to learn how you can follow along with his work and everything that he's doing, because it is truly mind blowing. Also, don't forget to join us April 5th through the 8th in Bandera, Texas for Confluence. It's just 45 minutes outside of San Antonio, so if you need to fly, you can fly in there. We have camping spots. We have RV camping spots. We have car camping spots. We have glamping tents that you can rent. We have so many different options for you to come and enjoy this incredible event under a total solar eclipse, April 5th through the 8th. Eileen McCusick. Dr. Amanda Vollmer, Dr. Andy Kaufman, Mark Gober, Aaron Abke, Veda Austin, and so many of my favorite people will be there both speaking and in attendance. It's an awesome, awesome event. Confluence is a one-of-a-kind gathering on a regenerative ranch amongst health and freedom community that includes workshops, lectures, regeneratively grown food, music, dancing, camping, glamping, bonfires, and more. You can get your tickets in the show notes or just head to confluenceevent.com and enter code ZEC. 10 at checkout for 10% off. All right, enough of me talking. This episode is going to blow your mind. It's a long one. Please stick around because I promise you it is worth listening to the whole thing. Um, if you've listened to or watched my other episodes with Lauren Lockman, Isabel Friend, uh, you're familiar with Veda Austin's work, my conversation with Gerald Pollack, um, really anything related to the episodes I've done on water, or if you're just fascinated with the nature of reality and you haven't listened to those episodes, I promise you, you will love this one. It is an incredible conversation. So without further ado, here's the episode with Dr. Mario Zapatera. Listen to the language of the last three and a half years. Lockdowns, travel restrictions, stay-at-home orders. This rhetoric, written by government agencies and corporate media, speaks to a clear intention, a concerted effort to keep us in place. Fortunately for us, a real grassroots movement powered by real men and women can never be stopped because mankind will always find the way forward. And this is where it all starts. With the Way Forward's new membership platform, you can connect with like-minded community and like-minded businesses near you by simply typing in your zip or postal code and setting a radius. 
We also have a marketplace featuring the best holistic health brands and products with deals you won't find anywhere else. And the best part is you pay whatever you want to be a part of it. The way forward starts with a growing community coming together to share ideas, form local groups, and conduct business with like-minded men and women. Because if we're constantly being told what to do by so-called authorities, it's easy to feel helpless, but it's essential to know that we're not. Each of us has the power, and that power amplifies when we come together. There are many more health-conscious and sovereign-minded men and women than we realize, and this is where we all meet. Visit thewayforward.com to join virtually, connect locally, and pay whatever you want to be a part of it. This is The Way Forward. So, Mara, I was introduced to you by a mutual friend of ours, Veda Austin. She sent me a presentation you gave, not this last time around, but a, a while back to, I, th- I think, some of her audience related to cerebral spinal fluid. I hope I can say that without stuttering. Cerebral, I'm just going to say CSF because that's what you call it, right? That's it. CSF, okay. And it was incredible. It was it it blew me away and it sort of makes sense as, especially as it ties into yogic traditions and um, even Tibetan Buddhist traditions, which I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit during this, but um, let's, let's start with this. You just giving your background and what led you into this line of work. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> story there. Um, you know, it, it, it really started about, just an inward inquiry, an inquiry about what makes us ourselves, what makes us us in essence. Um, and so going into college, uh, I was trying to figure out kind of what major to go into and, um, through, you know, just sort of taking classes and things like that and really having this fundamental question of like, how do we become, this multicellular, totally dynamic human being from a, from, from an egg and a sperm coming together. And, um, you know, we were studying things like DNA, RNA, protein cells. Um, and I I was at UCLA at the time and, and UCLA had a new major called, uh, molecular cell and developmental biology. So it just sort of took all these pieces and it put it together into a major. And I was like, you know, this is, this is, this is my major. This is kind of trying to understand from a molecular perspective, how does the molecule work in the cell so that the cell can work in the tissue so that the tissue can work in the organism so that the organism can work in, in, in the world, in, in the universe. Um, and so I decided to go to um, to medical school and try to understand, you know, t- try to continue understanding the human body, essentially physiology, anatomy, um, health, diseases, uh, but also having a, a a very. I was always I always had this this very much sense of you know continuing to do research and um, an inquiry into. You know, how do these things actually happen? What actually makes it? And so I decided to do an MD PhD program. And what Can I ask that you is, a quick question on that, real quick? Yeah. How much of what you learned about cell biology and genetics do you think is have you have you reconsidered? Let's ask it that way. In terms of um, I mean, it's it's essentially to me, it's like divinity in action. Yeah. Um, and so you know, when you see something and, you know, when, when, when you study like a, let's just, you know, let's just say a hydrogen bond, you know, the hydrogen bonding to an oxygen or something like that, or two oxygen molecules binding each other in, 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 in a gaseous form, um, you know, you, you, you just marble at, you then ask, well, what is that, right? What is that made out of? And then you go down and, 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 
it just in that question, which is the same question that I had of like, well, what's me, right? Who am I? And I've got to ask, well, if what, you know, what am I? And I've even broken it down to, you know, the number of elements that my body is made of, for instance, you know, the, 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 the proportion of each one, you know, it's like, well, well, we're this much hydrogen, we're this much oxygen, we're this much nitrogen, but we're not just those individual, like, and atoms put together, um, those then become molecules, you know, which then become the, the a protein or some sort of, you know, more high, uh, higher ordered structure. Um, but I'm also, you know, uh, that much nitrogen. And, 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 and so there was always this play of here I am, but what, 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 what else am I? So, um, I think it really informed me because I think, um, every time that I got to look through a microscope, there was always this incredible, um, really visceral sense of this is absolutely amazing. And there's got to be, you know, there's got to be a some sort of higher order here that's organizing. Yeah, that's what is what is animating this? this? What is animating exactly. these little things that I'm looking at is kind of your line of inquiry, I'd imagine. Exactly, exactly. How does this all of a sudden sort of, you know, start? How does it all, yeah. how, how does, you know, how, how does a, let's say an, an actin or a myosin molecule in the, in the cell um, uh, actually start to move? You know, mm -hmm. how do these vacuoles in the cell that we're studying get transported to the membrane and bind and then know exactly when to go, where to go in that exact moment that you are needing your muscle to contract or whatever it might be. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's like, this is just like, you've got to stand back from that and just be like, okay, this is, you know, this is absolutely amazing. We can, we can learn the mechanisms. Um, but we continue to go, even in my own practice is sort of like asking the question, like I continue to go back right? Like, like, like what, okay, it's moving, it's binding that, but what, what determined that movement prior? And there's always a point that, 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 that I feel like we can get to. And then, and then it's like, there's got to be something else here that we don't yet understand. Um, and, 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 and so that really informed, you know, that was really informed me was just this miraculousness, this miracle of, of, of all of us, of each being of every cell of every organism of every molecule. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that already informed me of, 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 of from a very visceral perspective. Um, and even when you go back, you know, when, 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 when people say things like, all one, you know, what does that really mean? Um, you know, you could take it from different perspectives from a purely scientific perspective. However, it also makes sense. Um, so, you know, if you think of like, you're breathing in oxygen right now, right? You're breathing in oxygen. Let's just take oxygen. Simple example. You're breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide. Okay. That carbon dioxide then is going to go out and it's probably going it, to, it might buy into a plant. Plant is then going to take that, go through photosynthesis, use the energy of that, and then spit out oxygen, right? But if you take that oxygen molecule, for instance, how many times do you think that oxygen molecule has been shared between people? And maybe like even fundamentally a part of people at some exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah. Fundamentally a part of somebody yeah. that then may have actually died or passed away and the gas actually gets emitted from the dying process. And now you're breathing that oxygen molecule in, using it in, it's going in, it's going to provide oxygen to your, to your tissues or whatnot. Um, a, a carbon, carbon molecule, right? That's the basis of organic chemistry. The carbon molecule is the basis of all of organic matter in essence. So when you're eating uh, anything, when <laughs> you're consuming carbon molecules. Okay. When you consume that carbon molecule, what happens? Well, you eat it. And now, right, whatever that thing is that you're eating, maybe that carbon molecule uh, stays in your digestive tract and you eliminate it. And now it goes into, in, in, into waste, but maybe it actually gets absorbed into your body. And now that carbon molecule that used to be in the cow, chicken, vegetable, whatever it might be, is now actually building your muscle to make you stronger or going into your neuron to build a new neuron. So that carbon molecule, right? And now I pass away or we pass away and, um, you know, I get cremated and my ashes get dispersed in the ocean. 
and then a fish come and they nibble on the ashes. You could imagine this happening, right? And then you catch the fish uh, two years later, and that fish has actually used my ashes to build itself and become bigger. So you're, what are you actually, what are you actually eating? And so even from a, you know, from a very molecular perspective, it, it is all one. It's this constant cycle of, 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 of creation, destruction, creation and destruction of, 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 you know, being and non-being manifest and unmanifest. And it's happening in the moment right now. There's a manifestation and unmanifestation, manifestation, unmanifestation. And so, you know, from a perspective of all one, we could talk about consciousness, awareness, we could talk about all those things, but we could also talk about it from the perspective of like, you know, biologically, we really are. Yeah. How many times have I shared a carbon molecule with you, for instance, that was once in you and now is in me? Um, it, does that, is there any differentiation from the carbon perspective in that realm? Absolutely not. <laughs> there is no, you know, there's, there's no difference in that. Um, and so just kind of thinking about it on, you know, all, you know, on that level, and then even breaking it down, right beyond the carbon going, going, going down to the electron, the proton, the neutron level, and then even, even, even beyond that. So the, the sort of the inquiry, the inward inquiry process that I use now is sort of this breakdown process, right? Who are you? Okay, well, I think I'm this hand that's, you know, working right now. Okay, and what's that? What makes that? And so I think because because I studied so much of from the molecular and cellular perspective, that I have a very visual sense of like, you know, I can go into my hand and sort of visualize the cells. And then I can go into the cells and visualize the, the, the individual organelles in the cell. And then I can break that down into the individual molecules that are making up the organelles. And then the individual atoms that are making up the molecules. And you just kind of keep on going back to like, well, if I'm not that, well, what, you know, what am I? So it, it, it I think it was absolutely instrumental in, 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 in informing me. And that's why I teach it from a pictorial perspective, like to see things, you know, when I guide people into, for instance, the ventricles or the cerebrospinal fluid in the middle of our brain, I like people to see the images of it. I like people to see, get that sense of what it actually looks like, because, um, from my experience, the more, the better kind of, the more understanding I had about something, the easier it was to navigate that structure in even the energetic realm, let's say. So I had a fundamental understanding of like what a cell looked like, right? I had seen it in the under the microscope, I had manipulated them in the lab. Um, I had changed cells with DNA and RNA and, 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 you know, knocked genes out and stuff like that. So I had done all these experiments in the lab and now I could actually visualize it and, and have a fundamental sort of visualization of it. Um, and, and what I think that does is it's sort of by bringing that extra level of understanding that it, it sort of, it, it, it's almost like it triggers consciousness in essence. There's sort of like a feed forward loop of, of, Hey, it's informing. It's sort of like, it's sort of like this little information. It's almost like a little boost in essence. And, and then with that, there's like a spark in consciousness. And then, and then with that, I can come back to the visualization and it's sort of like this feed forward loop that can be very wow. informed and, 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 um, and really help in terms of guiding or, you know, resourcing and, and, and things like that. So yes, absolutely. Um, I think you're spot on in terms of, you know, how much it actually informed and how much, you know, the knowledge of embryology helped inform the understanding of the brain and then how much the, you know, how, how much our neuroanatomy classes helped me understand, even when I was just getting a, a, a session, um, where I was always in this process of sort of inward inquiry of like, well, what's, what's going on right now. Right. Almost like we're, we're our, our own scientists. And I do encourage people to sort of, you know, to, to ask these questions, right? Like what's happening? Where, where is that happening to me? What's the sensation that I notice? And because of my background in, you know, going to medical school, I had a pretty good understanding of the anatomy. 
Um, and, 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 you know, we had cut brains open that had been donated to, you know, to Harvard and, and, and held them in our hands and, and, and looked at all the cavities and, and, you know, palpated the inside of the ventricles and stuff like that. So there was a sense of like, there's a very sensorial perspective that, 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 that I had going into it. I didn't know this. It's not like I planned this, right? So yeah. it's not like I'm like, oh, you know, I'm going to get this and I'm going to do this meditation. This was just like, this was like, here are all these things, but, 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 like, you know, set up, you know, let's say orchestrated divinely by the universe. And then it was like, okay, now we're going to now, because you're the skeptic and all this stuff, which I was, um, you know, now we're going to, now we're going to open you up to this, to this other world. And, uh, and, and, and I was sort of, prepared for it, I guess. Um, well, yeah, I, I just wonder how other, um, scientists and, and just, I guess people who work in a lab setting, uh, see what you've seen and see something being animated in such a, an intricate and, and, almost beyond what we can comprehend a manner that's beyond what we can comprehend with our minds and like think that there isn't any creative force animating through all of us. Cause like, as you're sharing all of this right now, and this happens oftentimes when I think like really think deeply about the idea that God has always been, I, I get this feeling in my, in my chest and in my stomach that is like a, a, a whoa, just a, a very powerful like whoa. I'm 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 touching something here that is beyond my physical comprehension that I know to be true. That is just really impacting me and in, in sort of my heart, right? And is that the same experience that you have when when you've you know done these experiments? Totally. And at first, you know, I got to be honest with you. I would um, I would. Uh, not go into the experience. I would, um, shun it. I would suppress it. I would suppress that felt sense. Um, I was scared of it. Um, I didn't know what it was. And so I was like, Oh, you know, I, there's something arising in my, in my heart. So, you know, okay, let, you know, let me start thinking about something else quickly, or let me yeah. get up and go let get me stay a in my coffee. analytical mind state. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I, what I had to do is actually um, I, I literally remember the one day where, um, you know, I was walking to the bus to go down to, to go down to, 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 to Harvard and, um, where I just allowed, I was feeling that sense again, it was coming up and it was almost as if my heart was just going to, it was just going to explode. It was like going to connect with everything. And I'd always suppressed it. It was like this expansion was occurring and I'd always suppress it. I always closed it off. I'd always look at something else or, you know, put my hand in, I don't know, you know, like jiggle my, uh, my keys or coins or something, you know, try to make some sound or, you know, call my friend or something. Uh, and, and I vividly remember the day that I just said, you know, Hey, just let it be, you know, just let it, let it spread. And it was like this, this warm blanket, you know, it was 15 degrees outside in Boston walking to the bus. And it was like this warm blanket that all of a sudden, you know, was, was, um, uh, was placed over me. Um, and, 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 and it's never stopped. Um, and so that's pretty, you know, from a, from a personal perspective, that's pretty huge. And just like you said, there's this, you know, there's this knowing that is so deep and so powerful. Um, that's not anything that, that, that you get from reading books or anything like that. It's like, it's, it's just this knowing and there's nothing, you know, there's no, like, there's no, you can have discussions about it. It's sometimes ineffable. It's difficult to put words to it. Um, but you just know it. Right. And, 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 and that's pretty powerful. And there's no, like, I don't have to convince, there's no need to like convince you. I'm not like trying to like you know, win an argument or lose an argument or <laughs> yeah. it's sort of like, look, you know, like, uh, go on and, 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 and keep, keep living. Um, but I, you know, I would have to say, I, you know, I have a number of friends who are scientists. Um, I, I believe that the majority of scientists actually do feel that, um, wow. that they do, that they do feel that, that they do, that, that there is some sort of sense of greaterness, mm -hmm. um, the way that our society is put 
and the way that research is done in the United States and pretty much in the whole world is um, at least at the university level. There are some private institutions that are trying to kind of get out of this model, but everything is so grant based and okay. um, you know, you need to get your grants, you need to get your money. And at the end of the day, there is a, there is a sense of like, you know, a reductionist perspective. Totally. Um, and that's almost necessary because it's the easiest way to interpret things. You know, what's the one molecule that's creating this, you know? Um, and, and, and we went through that as well in terms of when we were studying the cerebrospinal fluid, everybody was like, well, you just analyze this great fluid and it's so comprehensive and stuff, but what's the one molecule that's like doing something I'm like, you guys are crazy. Like it's not, it's not one molecule, but we had, you know, we had to, we had to find the one molecule or one molecule that we could study, that we could follow, that we could manipulate that one thing, because if it's too complex, it's almost like it's too difficult to interpret from a purely like from a data perspective in terms of like getting that next, you know, getting that next grant so that you can continue supporting your family and, you know, having a lab and, and, and stuff like that. Hopefully, you know, we're going to get out of that model. Um, yeah. but I don't see it anytime soon. I do see it more coming from like the private uh, side of things where, where, where more and more people are getting interested in this and, and people that have, significant amounts of money can fund research that that is less reductionist and more. I know holistic. various projects going on related to that. And I think a lot of these people who are behind these projects um, are operating from the position, which is the same position that I take in that you, you mentioned reductionism. It's it's reductionism absent of the understanding of what you and I are talking about, of there's some sort of greater animatory if animatory is a word animating spirit behind all of this i think i just made that up but also the understanding that what's done in vitro especially as you continue breaking things down is contains many unproven assumptions that we sort of are forced to overlook regarding what happens in a complex biological physical chemical emotional spiritual electric being that is one you know just infinitely complex system. So what's done in vitro trying to make assertions regarding what happens in vivo, I think that's the sort of slippery slope. And then of course, uh, funding from special interests and, and pushing people in certain directions. I, I, I'm speaking your language and everything that you already know, but I'm just sharing that for the audience. But I think we're at, at the precipice of just something much more beautiful when it comes to to science and the way science is done. And it's, it's going to be some time before we get to that point, but it's, we're, we're on the precipice. We're almost there. I think people like Gerald Pollack, who I'm sure you're familiar with um, and his work are acting as the bridge, so to speak, uh, no pun intended there. Cause that's what we're going to get into here, but acting as the bridge to show what, how, how beautiful science can be and how um, you know, many of these, sort of accepted paradigms in science still need to be fundamentally questioned. Like even bringing in fourth phase water as it pertains to cellular biology, like how, what is, what is the mechanism of action there? Are our cells largely comprised of fourth phase water? So, you know, it's some of those things that are, again, we're, we're just on the precipice and I know I'm rambling on here, but I, okay. I want to, I want to back up now to your embryonic, uh, research as it pertains to CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, and and what led you to that? And then I think uh, I'd like you to share the one of the presentations so we can have some cool visuals for those who are watching on video. And for those who are listening on audio, I'll uh, make sure that Maro is uh, filling in the gaps and sort of narrating as best as he can too. Yeah, so... Um... I was, my wife and I, uh, I, uh, we decided to, uh, she helped me decide to take some time off of medical school, um, and to kind of go investigate these more kind of holistic healing modalities that were present. And so we went out to Santa Fe and we started, um, we studied at the New Mexico Academy of Healing Arts. And, um, as a student, you know, you're not only learning, 
um, you're, you're not only learning the healing modalities, but you're also receiving the treatments. And so during the, 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 the receiving of the treatments, I just started having some, um, some experiences. And t- to me, um, it was very profound. And, you know, I was sort of still inquiring the, this, this inward inquiry has never ended. Um, and so if you imagine, right, you're getting a treatment, you're on a, you're on like a massage table or something like that, you're getting a treatment and you're just noticing different things shifting in your body or different movements or different sensations and stuff. And even just from a purely like mindfulness perspective, you can follow those sensations and ask, you know, what, you know, what do they feel like? Where is it going? You know, almost just like a curious child investigating what's happening in your own body. Um, And so I started having um, we were getting some craniosacral sessions and I started having um, really intense sort of images of uh, sort of it felt like. Um, this pulsating energy was uh, was coming up my spine and it felt like it was not only inside my spine, but also throughout like the entire room. And um, and and it was coalescing in the in, in the middle of my brain wow. um, and the image and then this image would appear, you know, my eyes were closed and then this image would appear and it almost looked like um like the eye of Horus, I guess it kind of looked like a, it almost looked like kind of like a, like God's eye. Have you seen that image? Um, Maro, hold on. Yeah. Can I dive time out? In, in, when I've been in deep meditation or in deep Qigong with my eyes closed, I've had literally the exact same thing. It's like a big glowing eyeball that 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 is that that has the iris sort of outline. It's clearly in the shape of an eye with a big black, but kind of like white glowing center in the middle of it too. Yes, I've had the exact yes. same thing. Yes. So it started. Wow. So this it started and it, it it and and it was pulsating right, and it yeah. was just sort of it felt like you know it's like and I even had the look to 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 actually open my eyes to see because it felt like there was like a hologram that was coming out of my. Uh, you know, my, my, like my, my, my crown here and it was going out and there was sort of like a hologram, you know, maybe like six or eight feet away from me. Um, and I even had to open my eyes to see like, you know, was there something there? Was there some, you know, was there something on the wall, on the ceiling that would have given me this image, right? Like yeah. maybe there, maybe, you know, maybe I don't, maybe may I didn't remember it. And there was, I, there, there is actually, maybe there was a cloud or some sort of, you know, and there wasn't, you know, it was just a white ceiling. It wasn't anything. And so that's the part that I think, you know, just being a scientist helped because I didn't take anything like as, uh, oh, you know, oh, I'm seeing that like, I, I, I like, I'm, I'm really not that type of person where it's like, oh, I'm having this like amazing experience. Right. It's like, oh, this is interesting. What is this? Right. Or, yeah. or, 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 you know, wow, this is, you know, and so my first didn't write was it off like, as some product of the mind essentially, or like some, some weird mechanism that's like, oh, this, this is just our mind playing tricks on us. Or exactly or you know or like i'm this you know uh, i'm this like advanced spiritual being that's having this spiritual experience you know or anything yeah. like that it wasn't it was just it was like oh this is interesting you know this is what i'm seeing if i could if i could draw it this is what it'd be like um and um and so um and it was pulsating right it was pulsating and i felt the energy pulsating and because as i said like because i had anatomy and physiology i could ask myself like okay where in my body right where do i actually know to, where if i was to locate that what how would i describe it where 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 would that location be and it i immediately went to the third ventricle um which which is this sort of this is it's this midline space in the middle of all our brains and in the third ventricle there's this fluid called the cerebrospinal fluid and um the pulsation so again going back to kind of the the the, the science physician in me um you know so the first thing i asked is oh is the pulsation the same as my heartbeat 
And so I put my hand on my radial artery and, um, it wasn't, it was completely different. Then I was, I was like, Oh, well, what, you know, what else pulsates in my body? And then I said, Oh, well, my, my, you know, I'm breathing. So I kind of put my hand, I kind of moved my hands up to my chest and I just kind of felt my chest rising and falling and I could, you know, just pay attention to the breath. And the breath was in a different rhythm than this pulsation that was occurring. And so then I said, okay, well, it's not the heartbeat and it's not the breath. And, you know, what is it? And I was like, okay, well, this is, you know, kind of interesting. Told my wife, didn't really make a big deal of it. And, you know, obviously in science too, you know, you always try to do like, you always try to replicate the experiments, right? Not that this was an experiment I was setting myself up, but it was like, we were getting these sessions, we were learning how to do it. And so we were getting these sessions over and over and over and over again. Right. And the same thing just kept on coming. And so it was, um, it was repetitive. Um, it was consistent. It was different than the heart and the, and, and, and the breathing. Um, and so I went to my, you know, I went to my teacher at the time and I said, you know, Hey, this is, this is what I'm having. He goes, Oh, you must be feeling the, the, the fluctuations, the movement of the cerebrospinal fluid. And I go, the, the cerebrospinal fluid, like, you know, and again, I had gone through two years of medical school at this point, right? I go, well, you know, the cerebrospinal fluid doesn't move like that, you know, kind of like thing. Um, and, uh, and so again, I was, you know, I was, I was a skeptic. And so what I did is, uh, is I went home and, um, and, uh, oh, he also said, you know, oh, the cerebrospinal fluid is one molecule away from seawater. And I go, no, you know, I know enough about science that I'm like, that can't be a true statement. And so I was always kind of in this process of like that, you know, like a lot of people make statements, but like, you, you know, you can't just make statements like, like that without looking them up and, 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 you know, trying to determine if it's true or not, or could it be true? Right. Is, is there a hypothesis out there that could actually lead that to, to be true? Um, and so I went home and I, I, I actually went to PubMed, which is, you know, the national repository for sort of published research that has undergone its own scrutiny, uh, peer reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. And I started looking up with the cerebrospinal fluid. Like, what do we know about the cerebrospinal fluid? Does it move? Does it pulsate? Um, do we know what's in it? And, and I, I quickly sort of confirmed my, you know, it's not one molecule away from seawater. That was okay. All right. But does it move? And, 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 um, and then, you know, what does it do? And we had always been taught, right. That it's essentially like this, this fluid in the middle of your, it, it, it fluid in the middle of your brain on the outside of the brain. And it's mostly providing buoyancy to the brain. It's mostly providing like, like if you get hit, for instance, it's a nice shock absorber. Um, and it was providing some nutrients. Like it was a, you know, it was kind of a liquid medium, uh, that the, that your brain was sitting in. Fantastic. Um, and just continuing to get these, these, um, these sessions, I was like, you know, something, there's something going on in this cerebrospinal fluid that we don't yet understand. And so that was a, that was kind of a huge kind of turn, kind of switch for me because I was entering, I'd finished two years of medical school and I was entering my PhD years. And, um, and at Harvard, you know, they, they, you're doing a full fledged PhD and you have to come up with your own dissertation. And so anytime that you see an area of research that seems like it's an open field ahead of you, like, wow, we really don't know much about this fluid. It's sort of like, it's sort of like a Holy grail in essence. Like you could go, there's so many questions to ask that it just seemed like, wow, this, this could actually be a really cool, um, thesis project for, for, for me. And so, um, I came back to Harvard, we finished at Santa Fe and I, yeah, I came back to Harvard with uh, my now wife and, um, I decided to try to find a lab that, you know, may have been open to sort of investigating, um, the role of the fluid and, 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 and the thing about it that was sort of a big perceptual shift is, you know, whenever you grow a cell in tissue culture or like in a Petri dish, um, you need fluid in that cell, uh, on that cell to give it nutrients, to give it growth factors, to give it, you know, the things to keep it alive and stuff like that. And it just became very clear to me that the cerebrospinal fluid was this endogenous media that our brains were growing in. And when you look at embryologically, you know, embryologically, our brain is like one or two cell layers thick. And 
on the inside is just this huge cavity of fluid that's bathing all these cells. And so you've got to think, right? We always focused on the cells themselves because that's kind of what we give. Uh, that's what we give power to, right? What do you see? Well, you see the physical, right? You see the cell, you see the brain. So you're going to study the brain. But, but the question to me then became, well, what's informing the cells? I know the cells are important and they got DNA, but what's informing that, right? So again, what's prior to that cell or what is informing that cell? And when you're looking at something embryologically, we are completely bathed in fluid. And so there's got to be some information, whatever that information is, there's got to be some information in the fluid that is helping to direct those, direct the cells or the physicalness on kind of what to do or how to do it. Or, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a fluid flow state or something like that, whatever it is. But that was essentially the, the, the question was, you know, hey, I need fluids to grow cells in the lab. What's the endogenous fluid of the brain that's growing in the womb? Oh, it's actually amniotic fluid to start with and then cerebrospinal fluid after that. And even that people were like, what? Like, but developmentally, it makes perfect sense. And, 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 and the cerebrospinal fluid is sort of, you know, it's sort of this hollow, it's, it's, it's in this hollow cavity in the middle of your spine, in the middle of your brain, that's essentially providing all these nutrients and, and growth factors to the developing brain. Just if you look at it at, from that perspective, when I say information, right, a growth factor being released into a fluid state, being released into the media and providing a, an instruction to the cell that's at a distance away, that's an information, that's some sort of information transfer, right? Hey, we're going to release this into the fluid. And now we have this nice, you know, almost like, like the nice, uh, um, uh, uh, brain it's going to go and it's going to bind that and it's going to provide information now to the brain. Um, so when I say information, right, that's what I mean. I, we could look at what types of information now the cerebrospinal fluid could carry, but from a purely scientific PhD perspective from Harvard medical school, it's what are the molecules, growth factors, et cetera, et cetera, that are actually providing this information. Um, and so, so that was just like a big, and we knew nothing about it, nothing about that fluid. And so uh, we started investigating the fluid. We, uh, we did a number of, of, of mass spec analyses on the fluid. You know, we saw how much it changes uh, over time uh, uh, and, and, and just came out with some incredible results of how much information it's actually providing to the developing brain, not only for increasing the number of neurons in your brain, but also providing cues for like when a neuron should actually differentiate uh, or not. And also one of the biggest sort of discoveries is, 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 is it provides a niche for our neural stem cells to stay as neural stem cells. So if you took a cell and, to, and, and, and if you took a neural stem cell and took it out of its environment and you put it on a Petri dish with just any old media, it's uh, going to differentiate. So it's going to become a, a cell. It's going to differentiate into some other cell. You need to actually supply it information being growth factors and, and, and nutrients that maintain it as a stem cell. So you need to actually provide that information to the cell. And now you can get that cell to stay a stem, a stem cell. And for it to, when it divides it, now you have two stem cells. And then when those divide, now you have four stem cells and you don't get this differentiation. You change the media, you alter the media, you give it a different signal in the media, and now you get differentiation. You can actually try to program differentiation that way. Well, what we found is that if we took neural stem cells and we grew them just with cerebrospinal fluid, that we could maintain them in this stem cellness, that we could actually maintain wow. their stem cell niche. So there was something about making contact. There was something about the information that was provided holistically, right? I'm talking holistically um, from the cerebrospinal fluid that was keeping them as a 
um, as a stem cell. And then th now it's, you know, now it's, 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 it's exploded. Um, what we now know about the cerebrospinal fluid is actually, it, you know, it's absolutely incredible. Um, fine. You know, finally in 2013, um, a lot of practitioners felt that the cerebrospinal fluid had movement to it, that it would, that, that, that there was a pulsation to it. Um, what, 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 what the big discovery kind of coming out in 2013 was that during sleep, our cerebrospinal fluid does pulsate and it, and, and, um, and what they found out is, you know, we thought that cerebrospinal fluid was sort of housed in the cavities or the ventricles of the brain. Um, but during sleep, the brain kind of opens up and it opens up and, and they, they, they found kind of a new system. It was called, they called it the glymphatic system and the brain kind of opens up and the fluid is actually able to go through the brain itself. So through the brain tissue. And it, this was the first time, right? 2013, where they actually figured out why we had to sleep. It was, wow. that's why it was such that a big reason. study. Yeah. Like, why is sleep important? Like, why do you on a physical get... perspective? Because metaphysically, I have my ideas and what I've what I've been taught on the importance it, of sleep. But yes, I, I totally hear right yeah. from a purely physical. I'm talking about purely physical, yeah. right? And now, and so then, even from that, we'll get to other. You know, we'll get to like new hypotheses, for instance. But from a purely physical perspective, okay, when we sleep, we open up the brain to the fluid coming through it and we remove it of toxins that build up throughout the day, just based on our thinking and you know, just based on metabolism of the, of the brain tissue. Um, and so when we sleep, we remove those toxins, they go back and we take care of them, get rid of them. If we they, don't they're get pushed into our lymphatic system, I would imagine. And then, then exactly. that becomes a drainage pathway. Got it. Exactly. And there's this, and it happens in kind of like a pulse. Hmm. It kind of happens in a pulse. Now, immediately when you're reading that study, you're going, this is, this is, this is, this is amazing. Not only did, did, did we discover that there is actually a pulse, right? Um, that, that there is this pulsation, but then you have to be thinking, well, it can't just be during sleep, right? There's got to be other, there's got to be other mechanisms. So, and so my first, you know, so my first go-to was, well, well, what is sleep? Okay. Well, sleep is sort of this altered state of consciousness, let's call it. Um, it's a parasympathetic state. Um, and so clearly other altered states of consciousness where we're where we're in a really balanced parasympathetic state would probably activate this fluid this pulsation as well okay so that's number one all right um uh so what people now have done is slowly slowly right so now it's like okay sleep so now it's like whoa this fluid does actually move and with higher resolution imaging uh, using fMRI, being able to see tiny movements of fluid in the middle of our brain. Because remember, you have to go through all this tissue, get to the areas of the fluid and actually see if we can, you know, monitor the fluid moving. What we've seen is, um, you know, the heart rate has its effects on the fluid pulsations. Um, breathing has effects on fluid pulsations. So they did they, they did incredible studies when when you take a breath in, you are bringing cerebrospinal fluid up all the way up from your sacrum to your third ventricle in the middle of your brain. Okay. When we exhale, we're kind of pushing that fluid a little bit down from our from our like mid thoracic area down to our sacrum. Okay. So now you're connecting Oh, wow. So there's fluid movement with the breath, right? So now you're connecting. Well, what did that, does that have any implications on any of these breath work practices? That's what that I was just about done? to say with respect to like Kundalini yoga or literally any breath work, Qigong, I do a Qigong based breath work. Like, wow. So in the inspiration, right? When you're just collecting all that energy, right? And bringing it in, imagine like you're bringing all this fluid and it's coming into your third ventricle. All right. And if you're in a parasympathetic state, it's likely that the glymphatic system is open. And now it's actually not only going into the third ventricle, but it's also going into the brain and it's cleaning out all the areas of the brain. But it's also bringing whatever information the cerebrospinal fluid is able to house and carry. OK, so not only is it bringing those growth factors, molecules, hormones from a purely scientific perspective, but now we're breathing in a very rhythmic fashion. 
Okay. Our heart rate is synergized with our breathing because we know that the heart rate couples with our breath, right? Um, what sounds, what, you know, what, what resonances, what other resonances are we being exposed to that is also affecting the movement of the fluid? Okay. So, so now, right. So now it's like, oh, wow. So the breath changes, we can take dot deep diaphragmatic breaths and actually see this fluid going into the third ventricle. And it's like a pulsatile flow into the third ventricle, right? Create any cavity and do make a little pulsatile flow and have a rhythm to it. Right now you've got like an internal drum, right? Boom, boom, boom. Right now, how is that fluid then the dynamics of that fluid and how it's flowing? Now I'm just talking about information flow, right? Could you imagine that the flowing of a fluid could actually provide information? I mean, now with the work of Gilbert Ling, Veda Austin, Gerald Pollock and Masaru Moto, I would say absolutely. It's, it's, uh, yeah, totally. I bet right? when you came across their work, you're like, oh my God, this is all coming together. This now. is all it, it it's all coming to, it just makes perfect. It just makes perfect sense. Yeah. And so we haven't, you know, we haven't got to that, 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 that that's a real subtle, uh, 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 information transfer again, going back to, you know, finding a molecule, removing that molecule, seeing what it does much easier than trying to see, you know, how fluid fluctuations can actually uh, affect, um, the, 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 the information that the, that the brain is receiving. But, um, we know, for instance, so, so then, you know, from a scientific perspective, it's like, wow, well, how does, you know, scientifically, mechanically, how does information get transferred to the, to the physical matter? Well, it gets transferred through receptors. And so if we find those receptors, okay, on the wall of the ventricle, which is the wall that's bathing the fluid the, the, the wall that the fluid is bathing, then could we say that, well, if we find those receptors, then we can interpret that that information then is being transferred. So we know that we have growth factors, right? And we know that we have growth factor receptors done, right? So from a purely molecular perspective, we got the growth factors, growth factor receptor, growth factor gets released into the fluid. There's a receptor on the brain, it binds, and now that information now is transferred. Perfect. Okay. Well, we know that there's mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors are responsible for fluid flow. So how much, what's flowing in the fluid? Okay. And there's actually a beautiful study uh, that looked at the way that the cerebrospinal fluid was actually flowing in the ventricle. This was done in rats, actually directed the way that the neuronal cells were migrating towards the olfactory bulb, because in rats, they regenerate the olfactory bulb and then the stem cells need to get out all the way to the, they need to, they need to send a projection all the way out to, to the nose, to the olfactory bulb. And the way that it knows where to go, the way that the stem cell knows the direction to go is based on the fluid, the fluctuation of the fluid inside the ventricle. Wow. So we actually already have evidence that fluctuation of the fluid inside the ventricle can actually direct neuronal stem cells and where they migrate and where they go. Okay. There's also been studies that have shown photoreceptors. Now, why would you have photoreceptors to, to, to monitor light if you're not actually taking any information from, from light? Right. So if you have photoreceptors, if you have mechanoreceptors, and if you have growth factor receptors, chemical receptors, then right now, that's just from a purely physical level, right, that, that we're able to study it. Now we go beyond that and we say, well, the cerebrospinal fluid is 99% water. Could water actually be carrying some sort of memory or information that's beyond that which we know of yet or that you know has been studied rigorously in you know NIH funded labs but that doesn't stop from a asking the question or b conducting the research that would test that right and we do have people like for instance Veda Austin doing these studies on water looking at um you know uh, crystallizing it and and seeing that water holds memory or Masuro Emoto, that there's some sort of energy, some sort of energy transfer 
right, into the water that can hold memory, energy, information, whatever that might be. Right. So now we're kind of getting now we're getting more hypothetical from the cerebrospinal fluid perspective. But we've got to ask these questions. We've got to, you know, if we don't, it's like we, we we're, we're limiting ourselves. Um, and then you get into, you know, you mentioned uh, Dr. Pollack, and then you get into the fourth phase of water, which is could there be certain circumstances that we can learn to induce with the activation of our cerebrospinal fluid, because you could activate water and make it go into a fourth phase. They've shown it with like infrared light. And maybe that's why infrared saunas and infrared baths are becoming so popular. Maybe we're actually inducing a fourth phase. Mm. Um, could there be a rhythm? Right. Could there be something that 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 the way that you're breathing, the way that your uh, your breath is combined with your heart rate, the energy that's coming at you, whether it's like using a tuning fork or a Tibetan bowl or or a crystal bowl um, that you're actually affecting the resonance of the water. Right. You're putting energy into the water in the cerebrospinal fluid that's actually making it go into a fourth phase. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider sharing it with at least one friend or family member who you think could benefit from hearing it. You help us grow and reach more people by sharing it with those around you. Also, be sure to head to the show notes to check out our membership offerings, membership marketplace, and more. We all know that big ag is poisoning our food supply and big pharma's so-called medicine is straight up poison. What most people aren't aware of, though, is that most supplements are also filled with artificial sweeteners, dyes, GMOs, glyphosate, and a host of other toxic ingredients, even many of the more natural supplements. My good buddy James Benefico dedicated his life to crafting the world's cleanest, most nutritious organic supplements after a pre-workout energy drink caused heart palpitations so severe that he almost landed up in the ER. Organic Muscle was born, revolutionizing sports nutrition by using exclusively non-GMO ingredients from USDA organic farms. Since then, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have leveled up their fitness and their health with Organic Muscle's award-winning natural pre-workout. There's no jitters, no heart palpitations, no itchy skin, just nourishing organic food and herb-based ingredients for clean, sustained energy, strength, endurance, and recovery. Numerous studies have shown that Tonka Ali is the most effective herb in the world for naturally boosting testosterone levels. And we know that testosterone levels are depleting all over the world because of what's put in the food supply, what we're exposed to, Organic Muscle has the world's first fully organic Tonka Ali supplement. I only support and promote things that I actually use and I can say I legitimately use Organic Muscle products. Use code FORWARD15 at checkout for 15% off at organicmuscle.com. So many of us dream of buying some land, growing our own food, and becoming self-sufficient away from a society that's gone completely mad. What if it's easier than we think to make that dream a reality? Siblings Jamie and Shelby over at Living the Off-Grid Dream have cracked the code to getting land and living a life of freedom. They'll show you where to find land for $1 down, that's right, $1 down, with low monthly payments as well as how to structure your vision for a homestead, retreat center, regenerative farm, or community. It's one thing to have food, water, and land security, but it's an entirely different thing to have the financial security to buy the land and build it out in a way that aligns with your goals and aspirations. Their program teaches you how to make enough money on your land to cover all of your costs to make that happen. Plus, they've got you covered with pre-filled out plans to give you inspiration if you're not quite sure what your best move for your land is. And if you're a member of The Way Forward, you get a free one-on-one strategy call with Jamie and Shelby as well as a free bonus gift. If you want to turn your homesteading, off-grid, or retreat center dreams into a reality, join Living the Off-Grid Dream by clicking the link in the show notes or heading to thewayforward.com forward slash off-grid. I don't know if you see what I have behind me on my furniture. That is a tuning fork from the Biofield Tuning Institute and Eileen McCusick. So that's why I smiled so big thinking about all this because my mind... Ever since I came across Veda's work and Gerald Pollack's work, and then also the work of Eileen McCusick and the human biofield and frequency and water, there's just something to not only human health, but the nature of reality, the interplay between frequency, electricity, and, and water that 
we're just on the very, very, very tiny uh, precipice of like where this is headed is incredible. It, it really incredible. has incredible implications for literally the entire nature of reality. Yes, totally agree. Let, let's do this, Mara, if you don't mind. Let's let's pull up the presentation. Which one, based on what you know about your two presentations, either the first one that you showed me or the third one that you gave to Veda's group? Let's yeah. go with uh, the bridge. The bridge. I like that. Okay. <laughs> when you did mass spec on the cerebral spinal fluid, what were the chemical constituents that you found? Um, so we found, you know, over 150 and we had the best mass spec in the world. And, um, and, you know, this was a, this was at Harvard again. Uh, we had no idea what to expect. In fact, uh, when I got the call from the, um, the lab that did it, I was talking to, um, to my boss at the time and, uh, and he goes, you know, did they, did his question was, did they find anything? Um, and I go, yeah. And we both sort of chuckle because we, we both had no idea, right? We both kind of had no idea. It was kind of like this, this shot, this shot, shot in the dark in essence. Um, and I go, yes, they did. And, and, you know, I think before there were like something like 13 proteins that were described in the cerebrospinal fluid. And then we pull out, you know, uh, over 150 of them. Um, and, and so it, you know, it, it, it was, it was proteins from all, almost every single, um, sort of class of proteins that, that, wow. that you could imagine. Um, and then the more we understood, the more we went into, what this what was actually contained in the cerebrospinal fluid then we're like oh wow this is like this you know all these make perfect sense because the first thing you have to think about is in order to get any sample of cerebrospinal fluid you have to go through tissue so what's the contamination from the tissue so what we did is we compared it to a tissue specimen and it was completely different uh, and then we had two different csf samples that we compared to each other and they were almost, they, they were identical. So that was good, right? So we have to ask like, what's the contamination? Because it's so sensitive, you've got to ask what's the contamination. Um, and so what we tried to do is we tried to kind of look at if we were to just, you know, if all we got was like a whole bunch of tissue, then we would have had a lot of tissue proteins in there. Um, we didn't have a lot of tissue proteins in there. Um, the thing that really came out at me, and, 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 and I love the fact that you asked this question, is the number of what we call extracellular matrix uh, proteins. And these are proteins that are not found typically in cells that make up the extracellular matrix. So they're around the cells. They kind of provide support and structure to the cells, but they're not, they're not actually inside the cells. And that, so as soon as I saw that, I go, oh, that's interesting, right? So here's this liquid matrix that's inside these cavities that then hits the now this was before we kind of knew that that there was actually an opening to the brain but now that makes perfect sense because now what's happening is right so first i was like oh that's cool so you have this more dense matrix in the brain with like collagen and all these filaments kind of coming together. And then what happens in the fluid state? Well, it's a less, it's a less differentiated matrix. So it's still like a matrix, right? It's still a, it still had the proteins that were making up the extracellular matrix, but less dense, less differentiated. And so now you're going, wow, that's really cool. So that's the fluid. And then it goes into the brain and then and so there's this sort of condensing right there's even even at the physical level there's sort of this condensing of this extracellular matrix to then become the extracellular matrix of the brain that can hold you know that can hold the physical structure in essence and so i actually called it you know based on that analysis i actually called it you know it's like a liquid matrix it's a liquid wow. extracellular matrix um, which has, you know, which has obviously I've already gone into some of the implications of that, but, um, but just really cool. Right. And then we learn that, oh, wow, this actually opens up. So now it makes perfect sense. So the molecules of the extracellular matrix, well, the cerebrospinal fluid is 
that extracellular matrix, depending on what you know we knew about it in sleep. Um, but there's a lot of other uh, situations where it opens up the brain and we get that. So when you say open up the brain real quick, what, what do you mean by that specifically? That there's a, that there's a, a, a almost like there's like these like like secret cavities that sort of open up under under certain situations and it's okay. an entire system that kind of allows the cerebrospinal fluid to to go in from the ventricles into the brain tissue itself um and and really bathe the brain tissue with the with the cerebrospinal fluid what can, I, can I share what's coming up for me and see if it's like along the same lines that I'm sure you've thought so this this is this is the the fluid that becomes the matrix that holds that sort of holds cells together because it's exactly. outside of the cells, right? This is the fluid as you sort of propose here, understanding sort of the the metaphysical esoteric things that are at play that are holding the cells together. It's the the fluid that um, ancient yogic traditions and Tibetan Buddhist traditions are either making direct reference to or sort of alluding to especially with respect to the spine. And then we have the understanding that this is the fluid that is carrying information, but then also the understanding that when we sleep, a lot of um, esoteric traditions will say that that's when our consciousness is interacting with the etheric or the astral realms. And that's when our brains are then opened up and this fluid is pumping through our brains much more than it is when we're awake. I'm sure you've thought of all that, but I'm just kind of like revisiting these things and and are trying to articulate them for people watching and listening, getting their wheels spinning because mine are spinning all over the place right now on the implications of this. It is incredible, incredible. I completely agree. And and I got to be honest, you know, I I don't go into a lot of the implications of it because just just by me explaining the biology you're coming up with that implication. Yeah. Okay. So that to me is, is, is even more powerful than me giving you that implication is you're just listening to the biology of how this is working, you know? Okay. Well, I open up this and this goes in, wait, 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 wait a second. I've, this has been referred to in this and you're making those connections for yourself. Yeah. Right. That to me is much more powerful than me being like, you know, and there's this text and there's this and and this could be it and this could be it so that is sort of like that that exploration and now you know now you can go and be like wow okay let me just take this you know let me just take this as fact right there's a fluid in the middle of our brain that is bathing the inside of our brain the outside of our brain that under certain conditions, our brain tissue opens up, allows this fluid to kind of flow through. It goes all the way down the center of our spinal cord. It bays the outside of our spinal cord and it goes all the way down to our sacrum. Whoa. <laughs> okay, just that, right? I didn't say anything else, but now <laughs> just that. Okay, yeah. now, and this is where, you know, this is where it's fun, where it's sort of like, hey, that's, you know, that's, that's fact. That's what we know. Now, right, what are the what are the studies then that need to be done? Because they're going to be, you know, studies are going to continue. We're going to try to figure out how this fluid needs to move. Um, the next studies are we're going to move this fluid. We're going to activate this fluid. And can we actually decrease cognitive impairment? Because um, because now there's a, you know, a new hypothesis, essentially, that cognitive impairment is due to uh, inflammation and that if we're not sleeping properly or not getting enough parasympathetic rest, that the fluid is stagnant and it's not clearing out. And so therefore, toxins are building up. That's the next hypothesis. So now we're activating the fluid. So people are, you know, the new studies coming out are not only different breath techniques that are activating the fluid, but they just showed that ultrasound, you know, so directed ultrasound to the brain can activate the fluid in terms of movement. They showed that strobe lights, so like a, a, a repetitive, uh, a, a, you know, photo sort of light sequence can activate it. Um, so we're, what, what, what we're going to see is coming down the future, we're actually going to see, and we're already doing it you know, where we're, you know, we're teaching people how to breathe properly. We're teaching people how to get into a parasympathetic state. Um, but you're going to start seeing, you know, like goggles and, 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 and other things that, you know, and there might be infrared light coming out, you know, whatever it is. 
um, that is going to try to activate and you're going to be activating this fluid because because what we're, we're, we're the, the hypothesis is that we need to keep this fluid moving just like a river, you know, needs to continue to move. Otherwise, it becomes stagnant and, 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 and it starts to smell and grow, you know, grow um, algae and, 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 you know, parasites and all that other stuff where we got to have that fluid movement. And so how do we get this fluid to move? Well, sleep is a big sleep is a big thing in that. But what other things are, 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 are important in that as well? And that's kind of where, you know, that's kind of where the newer research is going towards. Yeah, I'd love to see the impact of grounding sunlight in breath work as it pertains to cerebral spinal fluid and yeah. keeping it moving. That's wow. Totally. You're on you're on the tip of the spear of something quite incredible. Let's see that. <laughs> it's so that's cool. pretty awesome. Are you just smiling all the time? Because I'd imagine I would be just like, oh, I my am. God, I- like, my <laughs> cheeks would probably get hurt with how much I'm smiling with the discoveries you're making. It's so cool. All right, let's let's jump into the presentation because we've already been going for an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. OK, so let me uh, let me share my screen now. So I do call it, you know, the cerebrospinal fluid water in the bridge. And if you um, could Mario, if you could narrate really well for those who are just listening to this episode. I will try my best. Yeah, yeah try um, your best. That's all good. Yeah. So, you know, just calling it water and uh, connecting it to the water, connecting it to the bridge. This is my experience. Um, you may have your your um, your own experience, but the majority of people who kind of bring awareness to the cerebrospinal fluid get this sense as it is a bridge from, you know, we call it whether we call it the infinite to the finite or the unmanifest of the manifest or the spirit to the body, uh, whichever one, you know, whichever one you want to kind of relate with, but there's this bridge, this conduit, this path. Uh, and so that's where that, you know, that's what that essentially comes from. Um, and so just looking at some of these images here that there's this, you know, there's always sort of a condensation of, of energy. It seems like from like the universe, from this external to, to some place in, 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 in the brain, that some place in the head, that there's sort of like a vortex or um, some sort of sense of, of, of coalescing. And this is, you know, this is exactly a visceral experience that 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 I had um, while I was getting craniosacral therapy, uh, and so you know, just asking, do these images have any relevance to you, to us, uh, to our physical manifestation, um, and then how you know why I relate this to the cerebrospinal fluid in essence. Um, I love this quote by uh, Yogananda. Um, the consciousness enters the body by way of the brain and spine. The fact remains we can never know anything except through the medium of the senses so long as the life force remains trapped in the body. There is a way out forever. It is for the life force to merge with the cosmic energy. So there's this sort of merging, right? So there's this cosmic energy and 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 and, and the life force for the consciousness to merge in the infinite. So again, this sense of unmanifest manifest infinite finite um the way to accomplish this end is to withdraw the life forces from the senses and center it in the spine so again the way that i see this is sort of the senses what what he's referring to in my opinion is our attention Mm -hmm. okay what our attention is paying attention to and a lot of times what our attention is paying attention to is everything that's external we're looking we're hearing we're listening we're, we're touching we're feeling um et, et cetera et cetera and so this is again that that bring it bring it within bring it inside focus that attention in and he specifically says you know center it on the spine okay and this the reason why you know, I didn't read this and then try to do it and then and then and then be like, oh, you know, this happened. To me. This is like this happened to me. And then I read <laughs> this and I was like, whoa, that's you know, that's kind oh, of wow. that was like the whole point of putting up, uh, you know, my website on the CSF. OK, center it in the spine, direct it upwards toward through the spine to the brain. And thence out the Christ center between the eyebrows. So again, you know, where did I sense this in this energy sort of pulsating, right? Is I, I, as I, as you saw, you know, I was, I was pointing to the middle of my eyebrows, right? Yeah. The yeah. spine is the highway to the infinite. Okay. Now, if, if, you know, granted, I don't like take everything that I read, you know, and just be like, oh, he's right. Um, but when you do read something from somebody as wise as Yogananda, you're going, huh, 
the spine is the highway to the infinite. What does he mean by that? Right. Because he obviously, he obviously had a profound experience and went out and taught this to the world and, 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 and had a profound experience, uh, um, uh, effect on many people. Okay. The spine and the brain are the altars of God. That's where the electricity of God flows down into the nervous system, into the world. So now again, right, Yogananda talking about not only God, but the electricity. So there's this energy, there's this electric, you know, there's sort of this electric. And, and if you've ever had any experiences of feeling as if there's an electric pulsation or there's this transference of energy, what that actually feels like down in into the nervous system, into the world. And the searchlights of your senses are turned outwards. But when you will reverse the searchlight, so again, you're reversing this, the, the searchlights being our attention through Kriya Yoga and be concentrated in the spine, you will behold the maker. Mm. That's what self-realization teaches. The technique of meditation, recharging the body battery with cosmic energy. So again, electricity God, body, battery, cosmic energy, right? We're, 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 this is all related to me. This is all related to, um, to fluid movements, to the electrical transmission of um, cosmic consciousness through this sort of maybe electrical medium um, into the fluids and then from the fluids into the whole physical body. Ah. What is so is cool about what you do is you take what's happening from a biophysical perspective with your knowledge of the human body and you contextualize it with all this. So I, I mean, you, you're like the perfect bridge itself between <laughs> you're, you're the perfect spokes, spokesperson rather for the bridge, I guess. Um, having dabbled in both word worlds yourself. There you go. No, I appreciate that. Um, you know, and then and then again, he says, you know, for it is not a creed or a dogma. And again, you know, it's like I have nothing to win or lose here. You know, it's like a, I'm really not I'm not I don't make any money from any of yeah, this yeah. stuff or anything like that. Um, but a science of soul and spirit. And that's to me, that's really what it you know, that's really what it is, is 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 how can we start to shift that focus and, and study the soul, study the spirit? What is happening in this transference of cosmic consciousness to the body, right? How do we, how do we even think about creating the, the, the machines or the, 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 the um, you know, the, the diagnostic or, or whatever, you know, the imaging that's necessary. How are we thinking about going to the next level and seeing, you know, because before x-rays were, were exist, existed, people didn't even think that we could see inside the, you know, and then x-rays came and then CT scans came and then MRIs came and now MRIs are being, you know, so to me, it's like, how are we advancing the science of the soul and the spirit? How the soul descended from the cons cosmic consciousness into the earth and the body and the senses is the purpose of this work. So, again, this sort of this this this, this descent, this differentiation, um, this uh, this manifestation from some some and unmanifest. And to me, it's not only how the soul descends or how the spirit descends from the cosmic consciousness, but then there's a two way, there's a two way highway that's happening here, that it's from the spirit to the body, from the body to the spirit. And it's not just a descent. It's an ace. It's an ascending as well. Descending, ascending, descending. And so there's, there's a, there's a, there's a perpetual two way highway that's happening. And so then I go into the into the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and so, you know, the there are and so I've already tried to explain, you know, a little bit how I, I, I'm seeing the fluid really being that electrical, uh, you know, if you drop a bolt of electricity in the fluid, it's going to it's going to travel. Boom. And it's going to travel faster than it's going to travel through, you know, through bone or any sort of dense tissue or anything like that. And so the fluid being the cerebrospinal fluid now, the, 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 you know, the spine and the brain, the altars of God um, creating this electrical. Well, it, it's just the anatomy, the anatomy is there for us. Mm. And it's these, it's the hollow vesicles. So in the middle of your brain, you have these fluid filled cavities, um, which you can see here, it's, they're called the ventricles. Um, and, and, and these are, if you just take out the brain, the fluid disappears and you, all you see is the vent, all you see is the cavities. Yeah. Okay. So imagine that you have these fluid filled cavities in the middle of your brain. Um, 
and 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 what's neat is the there's a cavity right in the middle sort of if you were to take it you know from the middle of your eyebrows and sort of uh, straight back and over your you know the tops of your earlobes let's say and go straight in that it right there there's a it's called the third ventricle and the third ventricle is a perfect midline space and i call this the third eye or uh, or the eye of the soul some people call it <clears throat> excuse me, some people call it the cave of Brahman, um, uh, you know, the mystical palace, crystal palace. Is uh, it true that they've discovered rods and cones in the pineal gland? Um, I'm not sure about that. They have okay. discovered what's called, um, what's called uh, piezoelectric crystals okay. in it, yeah. which, um, which with sheer stress or, um, or, um, yeah, so it's activated by sheer by stress, um, mm -hmm. like 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 shearing it that 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 the crystal actually emits light. Um, and that's incredible to think about the implications of like something like quartz crystal, which we know are used in all of our technology devices. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. To, re to, re to receive frequencies specifically, receive and transmit frequencies. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so this third ventricle is essentially it's in the midline. It's right in the middle. Uh, it's communicating with all the other ventricles. And like you mentioned, the pineal gland here in the back of the third ventricle, uh, the pituitary gland in front, hypothalamus, thalamus, all these really important sort of brain structures are on the walls of the ventricle. This is right in the midline. So if you were to imagine your third eye, right, being this third ventricle, many people put it on the pineal gland. My experience, though, it's that it's actually the vent, it's actually the space. And there's this uh, there's this chemistry, there's this sort of, there's this, there's this, you could call it like a, like an all chemical reaction that occurs when the energy comes up the spine into the third ventricle, mir mirroring and, 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 and hitting the pineal gland and influencing the pituitary gland, that that's when sort of this opening of the third eye occurs, that there's a, that there's a, that there's sort of an all chemical reaction that occurs specifically in the space of the third ventricle within the fluid that that that's the opening of the third eye with clear vision and 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 you know increased uh, intuition etc wow. etc cetera, et cetera. Wow. you did mention a little bit of the pineal gland you know just taking the pineal gland um um in terms of you know what it does have uh, they do know that for instance it has melatonin uh, and melatonin is released into the into the CSF and um it is released when we are exposed to less light and then it bathes the entire brain. And so it goes through the entire CSF and it bathes the entire brain. Um, another molecule is DMT is dimethyltryptamine, which is found in a lot of, um, a lot of sacred plants, um, ayahuasca, uh, et cetera, that are used for very, very powerful ritualistic ceremonies. Um, and so understanding Right. So a lot of people are kind of tapping into this endogenous DMT uh, activation where uh, whether it's through breath work um, or through activation of the pineal gland, that the pineal gland can actually release DMT into the third ventricle, that then it can be bathed just like just like melatonin, that it can go through throughout the entire vent ventricular system and bathe all the important areas of the brain. Um, and, and, and in essence, sort of creating an endogenous DMT uh, experience for us for, for, um, you know, and, and theogenic purposes, let's say. So there's a lot of research going into that, going into, uh, endogenous DMT, how the, how this can be activated, uh, what are the proper ways of activating it safely, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So just to kind of throw that out there in terms of pineal gland right there in the third ventricle, um, so the cerebrospinal fluid essentially uh, is right in those again, like I said, right in those ventricles. Uh, it's clear. It's clear fluid. Um, it's ninety nine percent water. Uh, it covers again the outside of the brain. Uh, it covers the outside of the spinal cord. There's a little canal in the middle of your spinal cord, uh, and it goes all the way down. It's called the central canal of your spinal cord. It goes all the way down your, your spinal cord. Uh, and if you were to look at the lateral ventricles, um, if you're not on video, you can just image, you know, do a 3D uh, search of the lateral ventricles. Um, this is what they look like. 
right? So you can see there's sort of, this is the third ventricle in the middle. Uh, it has a, anteriorly, it has a little connection here to the lateral ventricles and there's two lateral ventricles on each side. Uh, and then it goes down into the fourth ventricle. This is next to like our cerebellum uh, uh, and our midbrain. Um, but you can ask, you know, just in terms of looking at this structure, you can go, why in the world would there be a structure like this in the middle of our brain? <laughs> like, You're why is there, yeah. you know, here, like you could imagine, first of all, it's not just a, it's not just a blob. It's not just a circle. It's not just one cavity. Okay. But it's a very intricate cavity that gets both hemispheres of the brain. Uh, and, and this is a cool part too, because this little extension here from the lateral ventricle back goes into our, our occipital lobe. Wow. This actually uh, is, um, this goes back into like our visual cortex. Wow. So the question is, you know, why does it need to project? Why does this projection even need to be there? Why does there need to be a projection here back into the occipital cortex to get our, our, our visual cortex? Um, and, and you might, you, you know, you might just kind of hypothesize some things. Oh, well, if there is any information transfer through the cerebrospinal fluid, then that we want, you know, people, many people describe certain visions yeah. or light um, or, you know, like what I described sort of this eye, right? So how is that actually influencing then the visual cortex um, um, during, during, um, during, you know, meditative states or whatnot? The other thing well, is- I would say also possibly the follow on extra sensory states that people have, like being able to actually see someone's biofield or aura, perceive it with their, with their eyes. Exactly, exactly. Or, you know, when you're doing a life review, like people have described in near death experiences, um, you know, seeing the seeing the light, whatever, whatever it might be. So that's, you know, that's essentially what the cerebrospinal fluid is. Um, and so it's bathing your brain. It's in the inside of your brain. You have about 150 milliliters of it. Uh, we turn it over approximately what we think now three to four times a day it might be more. Um, but we produce anywhere about half a liter of CSF is produced a day. Um, so you're constantly making this. So it's important that since you're constantly making it, you're also constantly absorbing it. And that's where a lot of the, you know, getting this fluid to really continue to move uh, and be clean and clear uh, and, uh, and, 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 and be in the flow can, can really help. Um, so this is an image, this is an MRI image of a human. Um, and, and you can see this is their brain here. Uh, and everything that you see in red is the cerebrospinal fluid. So essentially you see this as uh, the brain and the, and the entire cord here, this gray thing here in the middle of the red is, is the spinal cord that's going all the way down to their lumbar vertebra here. Um, it's all sort of bathed in this fluid. <clears throat> And it's your flo it's floating in it. Okay, so it's creating a buoyancy. So if you were to look at it like can I, this, can I ask a question about that previous image just real mm -hmm. quick? It, have you thought about the implications of there being a larger or a higher concentration of the CSF towards the bottom half and specifically the bottom two chakras, bottom three really chakras? Yeah, as the um, you know, as the as the resting place for the kundalini yeah <laughs> that's the way that's immediately what i saw when i looked at as the bath like, as wow, the lake makes total sense yep as the wow. lake as the sacred you know and and when you look at this bone you know this bone here is called the sacrum when you look at the sacrum you know why is it called the sacrum the sacred you know sacrum it comes from the latin words you know os sacrum sacred bone um you know when you see so much fluid there why you ask the perfect question again you know why does it if it was just if it was just providing support for the spinal cord, why would it not end right here, right? A little sac ending right here and then some tissue here, just anything supporting the nerves coming out or anything like that. Um, but yet it keeps on going all the way down and it goes to the, to the, so is there, right? So then this begs the question then, is there something that's held? Is there some information, energy, whatever it might be that's held in that area, uh, that, that, that is important that, 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 you know, that, that area is important for some sort of activation, 
that just like the Yogananda quote, right, that we focus on the spine and we bring this energy up, that we bring this energy up into the brain, in my in, in, in my perspective, into the third ventricle, that we activate the pineal gland, that with the pulsation of the fluid through our breath and this intentional uh, visualization that we can actually activate the pineal gland. Um, we can activate the fluid with the, these fluctuations, these movements, et cetera, et cetera. But look how the brain and the spinal cord are this buoyant, you know, it's sort of like a buoy in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Wow. Right. So here, right. So the, so the, so the, the, the pink here is, 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 is our brain and spinal cord. We have water in the middle and water on the outside. We call that cerebrospinal fluid. And this is a buoyant, you know, this is, this is sort of, this is a buoyant thing, right? So imagine, you know, any practice that you do, that's creating a little bit of rhythm in the brain, a little bit of rhythm in the spine and the, and, 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 and the brain and, you know, like oscillating it. Right. I think Starting of some the, cymatics, like what happens when you like put certain exactly. and frequencies through water, it literally creates these geometric, beautiful geometric patterns. Exactly. And so imagine that that's that now, you know, the physical then is our brain and spinal cord, and it's all being informed by this water, by this fluid, by this column of fluid that is surrounding it. Wow. Um, and so, you know, so just to give just to give you a perspective, for instance, in terms of like buoyancy, um, you know, the brain can be anywhere between twelve hundred to fifteen hundred grams uh, if you're holding it outside of the body. Inside the body, it's like twenty five to fifty grams. So the relative weight of it is is significantly decreased by the buoyancy of the fluid. Um, so pretty, you know, pretty neat, you know, so you got 25 grams, you know, bouncing up and down in this fluid. Um, if you were to take that out, it'd be like, it'd be, you know, 1.5, mm -hmm. uh, kilos. So significant difference. Um, and so this is where I go back to embryology and I do recommend, you know, people kind of look into embryology or, or contact me. I do have a, uh, on YouTube, I did a program called awakening awareness where we go into the, um, into the, uh, uh embryology again, it's free. It's, it's 24 sessions. Um, we'll throw it in the show notes for, for okay. people who are watching or listening. And you know, the, the reason is again, uh, there's this element that uh, I, I, I believe in that has been apparent for me in that the more um, the more I can visualize things or the more that I can sort of understand things, the better uh, it's I, I can help. It's sort of like I'm more there's a better relationship with the energy um, as I am as 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 we are in relationship let's say as there's as there's guidance both from the energy and from myself kind of we're working in unison in essence so uh, this is why i go into the um uh, into the embryology it's important to understand where this fluid is coming from the other uh, point i i go into this is because if you're going into a meditation on the cerebrospinal fluid um you may uh you may go back to your embryo you may go back to a state that um, you don't recognize um, that that may be your embryologic state. It may actually even be um, the egg. It may actually be the egg, you know, prior to being placed in the fallopian tube, prior to uh, the sperm fertilizing it, for instance. So you've had people reflect back that that's what they've experienced by meditating on the cerebral spinal fluid? Yes. Wow. So through the fluid, all right, they're actually able, again, kind of this bridge, this medium, this, you know, this, uh, this conduit um, that they can go back through development for themselves and they can go back to any point in development because the fluid, if you, well, well, we'll get into embryologically sort of anatomically, right, where it's coming from. Um, if it does hold a memory, then the memory is in the fluid. It, it, it's just going to be in it. Okay. So if you look at this picture right, right here, so, you know, this is the picture, um, of, of, of a developing embryo. This is as it would be, uh, it, it, in the womb, let's say. Um, and, and, and this black area here that you see, that's the only area of this developing. So this is all coming from, um, um, uh, the embryo itself, but this is the only part that's actually going to become us. 
Wow. Okay. So it's this, it's, it, it, it's this area right here in the middle. And at first it's essentially, you know, it's a, it's a glob of cells at first, and then it becomes a, a two layered sheet and then it becomes a three layered sheet. So there's a time in your development where, you know, we're all two layered, we're all just two layered sheets of cells. Like a, like imagine like a two layered cake, right? Mm. Chocolate and vanilla or strawberry, whatever you want to call it. Okay. <laughs> Only right. if your parents were black and white, but yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You're mixed. All right. Um, so imagine like a two layered cake. Okay. And uh, on top of this, you know, so on the top you have fluid and on the bottom you have fluid and you are the two layered cake, but this is actually, this is all that's coming from the, the, the embryo. So here's actually the amniotic fluid. So if you were to picture yourself in development as if you are laying on your belly um, and on your backside is where the amniotic fluid would be. Hmm. On the front side is actually where your so yolk sac would be. Uh, and, and this actually gets taken into your, it actually gets taken into your belly. So imagine, right? Like you're floating in fluid as a two layered sheet of cells with the amniotic fluid in back and the, uh, the, the yolk sac in front, you bring in the yolk sac into your belly and this amniotic fluid is on your backside. All this, and you're housed in, in the chorionic fluid, which is all here on the outside. Okay. So what happens is, so I was, I was mentioning that sheet of cells, right? So here's the sheet of cells. And what happens is that that sheet of cells undergoes, a, it, it, it invaginates, it undergoes this sort of invagination. And then as the bottom, as the middle drops down, the sides come around and close on itself. So the fuses, okay, what that does is it actually creates a, uh, a tube. And th this creates what we call the neural tube. And this is the process where you start to differentiate. So here's the amniotic fluid on the outside. Through the process of this invagination and creation of the neural tube, you actually start to differentiate the amniotic fluid from the outside to the cerebrospinal fluid from the inside. All right. So the cerebrospinal fluid comes from our amniotic fluid. So from a and I've said this before, from a homeopathic perspective, is there a vestige of your amniotic fluid in your cerebrospinal fluid? Wow. There absolutely is. All right. So that's the memory, right? That's the memory going all the way back to your amniotic fluid physiologically. Now you can do whatever you want with that, right? I'm just telling you what yeah, happens that's physiologically. that's incredible though. The implications of that, again, my mind's sort of all over the place with this. It's funny you mentioned homeopathy because throughout this entire time, I've been thinking about homeopathy as it pertains to this yes very pertaining very very relevant uh and so again spot on right so you're thinking of wow okay so my csf right now was actually the amniotic fluid in my mother's womb that's that's wow. kind of neat okay wow. so if, if this is a scanning electron microscope of a developing um of a developing mouse. But what you can see here, here you can see the invagination occurring. You can see those folds coming up here. And then here, what you see in 16S is part of the folds have actually fused. This area has not fused here. So it looks like an open cavity, right? So this is still where you're getting mixing of the amniotic fluid and the cerebrospinal fluid. And then here it comes closer together. And then here it's, it's, it's fused. And so now you have a full separation between the amniotic fluid and the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay. And so then this then continues into, into, uh, into development. And so if we were to look at that, okay, um, this is what it looks like for instance, at 25 days is this sort of, there's a, this is a hollow tube, mm -hmm. the hollow tube, you know, with some cells around the outside that have gone through the pink part here develops into the brain. And you can see just how much energy goes into developing the brain as between yeah. 25 days and 40 days, how much input, right? You're just thinking of now information. It's like, <laughs> It's going, it's starting to develop. More neurons are needed in that area. So there's got to be some information in that area to say, hey, we need more neurons. We need more neurons. We need to grow this, grow this, grow this, right? And at 50 days, this is what, what you start looking, you know, what the brain starts looking at. But all within this, 
right? Is that cerebrospinal fluid in, 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 in the middle, all these tubes have these, have, 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 uh, you know, this has a still clear, this, it just goes down like this, this, it starts slightly differentiating more, but it keeps on going down. And, and in the middle, there's a entire cavity filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And then this is at, at birth nine months, you know, you get a sort of a partially differentiated, differentiated brain that occurs. Okay, so every single cell in the neural tube that you see see here, um, you know, in the neural uh, it, it, that that be, that makes the brain, that makes the spinal cord, it's all bathed in the cerebrospinal fluid at one point in development. Based on what the brain needs, it will start to differentiate. So more cells are needed to grow, but then it actually needs to go and make the neurons. And so as, as more cells grow, then some leave the cerebrospinal fluid and go and make different layers of the brain. Um, and that's all happening. That's all happening during, during development. So this picture again, that I showed before, you know, if you imagine kind of this, <laughs> you know, going back from implantation, right into the womb prior to implantation and seeing, okay, this red here, which is all the cerebrospinal fluid we have now actually came from this amniotic fluid, tiny little bit of amniotic fluid right there. And here's our three layered cell, two to three layered cell that becomes our entire physical body, right? So you can it's, just see is, this. It's crazy to think about the implications of that as human beings have given birth throughout history like where what was the initial input and then like does it go back to adam and eve was there like a seeding of all of us at the same time yeah. it's my mind spins thinking about yep. that because it's an imprint of our mother who had an imprint of her mother and so on 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 forever exactly so that's why embryologically, you know, that's why I go through embryology, because it's so important in terms of not only people's experiences and really being able to ground the experience um, and not and, and not feeling like it's, you know, anything uh, uh, crazy or anything like Woo -woo, that. So to speak. There, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You might have an experience where. Um, you know, as you're paying attention to this fluid, that the energy, the information of this fluid starts to open up uh, and, and, that, and, that, and that there may be an experience of actually going back and, and sensing, um, you, you know, you as an embryo, you in the womb prior to even being, uh, you know, any sort of differentiated state, uh, you know, a three celled layer thick, a two celled layer thick um, and, and, and the, the initial, you know, the initial fluid that's held in the amniotic fluid and then even going back to the initial fluid that's held in the in the egg um uh so you know again this when i talk about information or or energy right we could we could drop it down to the level of a growth factor a hormone um, or we could drop it down to the level of you know the hydrogen molecule or the water molecule um, and following one 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 water molecule throughout this whole process um, or even you know the electron um, or the memory of the water that was stored in the egg in the grandmother's body okay so <laughs> wow okay so we talked a little bit about this, um, the role of the cerebrospinal fluid a little bit earlier. Um, what's cool is embryologically, for instance, um, when they look at the cells in a vertebrate's body, like us or a man, you know any mammal or anything like that, that is making contact with the CSF, evolutionarily, the cells that are making contact with our CSF today are evolutionarily similar to the exact same cells that in a starfish are making contact with the seawater. Wow. Okay, so if you just think of like what that cell for the starfish would be doing, well, why would a cell need to monitor the seawater? Well, it's gathering information. Right. Whatever that information might be. Oh, I sense food over there. Right. OK, I'm going to start to kind of go over there that I'm sensing a gradient difference of 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 some molecule that's in the water. OK, OK, that's you know, I, I remember this is kind of like food. Um, oh, you know, I'm sensing there's light over here. You know, maybe I need to get out of here and get into more darkness or something like that or 
the water is very shaky over here. You know, I need to go find a more, um, a, a more, uh, a, a, a more restful place, whatever it might be. Right. But there's clearly a reason why these cells that are facing the seawater that are gaining, that are gathering information for the starfish are evolutionarily the same cells that in us are gathering information from the cerebrospinal fluid. Wow. So that's why I say, even though it's not one molecule away from seawater, um, but it, it, but essentially, um, uh, you know, seawater is uh, our ancestral uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Have you looked um, and, into Quinton marine plasma by chance? No. I'll send you some stuff related to it. Um, okay. It'll it'll definitely pique your interest because of what you just said here related to seawater. Yeah, please do. Please do. Anything that, you know, anything that, uh, that, that kind of like, you know, um, expands upon this, expands yeah. upon this. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so that's just interesting to kind of like evolutionarily, these cells are programmed to receive again, receive information from the external environment. This being seawater in the starfish, cerebrospinal fluid in a mammal like us. All right. So again, we talked about the cleansing of the brain in 2013 was when the first studies were done. In 2019, they really saw uh, uh, this really profound effect. Um, and that's when a lot of people said, you know, our brain is really washed uh, during sleep with with cerebrospinal fluid. There were a number of, um, of, you know, Scientific American articles on it, et cetera, et cetera. And when you look at the roles of the cerebrospinal fluid, now we know that it transports nutrients, hormones, it regulates circadian rhythm, it regulates appetite, it provides guiding cues for cell migration, again, like we talked about. So the fluctuations of the CSF can actually guide cell migration. Uh, it instructs stem, stem cells. Uh, it creates an ionic balance. Again, it eliminates waste. Uh, it supports and protects the central nervous system, and it creates this buoyancy and shock absorber for the brain. Well, what else can it do? And this is where we get into the more, um, um, you know, hypothetical uh, questions, which are fully, in my opinion, um, these are, you know, these are hypotheses that should be that that that, that need to be tested. That should be tested. Uh, that are those funding flower needs. essences on the left? Yes. Wow. Um, and so, you know. When there's slowly research coming out, um, you know, whether it's Masuro Emoto's work or Veda Austin's work or, you know, the use of flower essence, I'm not sure if any, you know, anybody's ever used them, um, but that, that, that water uh, or that fluids can absorb, store and transmit energy. Okay, so this is starting to become uh, more accepted. Um, this is starting to become uh, more proven. And so if right? If water or fluids can absorb, store, and transmit energy, then could the CSF absorb, store, and transmit energy? And here I put, you know, the energy of the source. Yeah. Um, could there be a transmission, uh, you know, from cosmic consciousness, from source, um, through the cerebrospinal fluid, being a fluid, so this 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 electrical, this internal battery, this charge can just go instantaneously through the fluid to all parts of our body um, and transmit energy. And so that's you know that to me is the ultimate question that 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 again, the hypothesis is backed by by research. The hypothesis is backed by anatomy the hypothesis is backed by physiology and so we just you know we, we we need to continue going down in this path um and so again just asking yourselves you know why are the brain you know why are their ventricles formed the way they are we kind of touched on this the view on the left is as if somebody's looking at you the view on the right is as somebody's looking um looking to the left here um and so you can see you know if i'm looking at somebody that's you can see kind of these two horns coming out. Those are the lateral ventricles. Some people describe them as sort of um, as wings of a bird, that the third ventricle is, is, is the body of the bird um, with the beak going into the, into the, uh, into the, 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 um, the pituitary gland uh, and with the lateral ventricles coming out and sort of flying towards you, you can kind of, you can kind of see that. Yeah. Um, if you were to do a 3D model of it, you can definitely see how somebody could imagine it being a being a bird um, or sort of some sort of butterfly 
And then again, we talked about this, but this is what the inside of the ventricle looks like. So this is what the wall of the ventricle looks like. You can see there's these hair-like projections. Uh, these are called cilia. Um, imagine like these are antenna. That's what I was just about to say. They look like antenna. Exactly. So, you know, why would we have antenna on a wall in on our brain, right? This is the wall of our brain. So it's the wall of the ventricle that's making contact with the cerebrospinal fluid. And that's a, you know, that's a, um, um, that's a scanning electron micro, uh, microscope image. Um, quite beautiful, right? Now you've got to think why in the world would, would though, would all those structures be present in, you know, monitoring the, the fluid? So clearly just from looking at this, we're going, okay, the fluid is definitely being monitored. Right. Um, we're looking at molecules and somebody could say, yeah, well, it's, you know, it's monitoring for blood and, 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 you know, traumatic brain injury and, and things like that. Infections. Absolutely. But let's look at the receptors that we find on the ventricles of, of certain, um, you know, animals. So what we found is again, like we were talking about, we find photoreceptors that transmit light. We find chemoreceptors that transmit growth factors, ions and hormones and we find mechanoreceptors that transmit flow movement and vibrations so now put that all together yeah. okay this is just from the receptors that are found so so there is an ability to perceive information from light growth factors ions hormones and other chemicals and 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 molecules as well as flow movement and vibrations wow Wow. That last one really sticks out to me. That's incredible. All right. So if you do something, your cilia are moving and it's going, hey, what's going on here? And it's it's trying to understand that information. Okay. Is this something that we need to do something about? Is this going to continue? Is it going to stop? You know, whatever it might be. Um, uh, and so, and so, you know, as 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 we're moving, as we're creating, right, a vibration, a resonance whatever that might be there, we have mechanoreceptors that are perceiving that information, right? We still don't know what that information transfer then does or looks like, but those are, those are the next studies that are coming out. We've got to imagine that, 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 that this is actually monitoring uh, fluctuations in movement of the cerebrospinal fluid. And, and, and is there, are there, mechanisms whereby a certain resonance, a certain frequency will activate a certain receptor that will send a certain signal into the brain. Um, or, I mean, you I know, think of this in terms of like any of this psychic abilities that human beings have cultivated and just being so attuned to this, receiving information, the frequency vibration of, of something from somewhere and then being able to process it and, and use it in a way that is useful for, you know, that spiritually adept individual. Exactly. Wow. So again, you know, here, um, is, is the hypothesis essentially that this, um, this, that the cerebrospinal fluid being a fluid being 99% water could actually be a vehicle, um, for this transmission of information to the brain. Um, that there's no synapses that are necessary that you can get a fully synchronized transmission of information um, that we can learn how to uh, work with it, that we can learn how to activate it, that we can learn how to have a relationship with it, and that, uh, in my opinion, it could be it 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 is a bridge um, to the unmanifest, to the infinite, to spirit to cosmic consciousness, whatever you want to call it, whatever language or, you know, reference you want to use. Um, and so, you know, where has the, where has the research gone? I think we've talked about this a little bit, but, um, we're looking at how the cerebrospinal fluid moves. So many people have had the experience that there is a pulsatile nature to the cerebrospinal fluid. And now we've actually seen it in research. And this is only coming, this has only come out, you know, 2013 and, and, and beyond in, in, in essence. So people have had these experiences prior, um, including myself, uh, and have felt it, have palpated it, have, 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 you know, have had that authentic experience themselves. This is the real first time that we're seeing that, yes, this fluid is actually, you know, is movement. It is very dynamic. 
Um, there's movement with the heartbeat that we knew uh, prior, but that other actually things that we could actually activate the movement of the cerebral spinal fluid. And here, what you see is, is, you know, inspiration leads to cerebral spinal fluid flow towards the brain. Wow. Um, and expiration leads to from about the thoracic vertebra four on down, it actually leads to movement uh, away from the brain. So when you inhale, you're bringing it up when you're exhale from like mid thoracic, you're pushing it down to the sacrum. Um, so now, you know, we can have, we can actively say based on research, right? That your breath can actively modulate cerebrospinal fluid flow. This is pretty cool. Okay. And so um, imagine any like breathing exercise that, that, that you've done. Wim Hof now is talking about this in terms of when he takes a, when they take a big inhale in, he's bringing his cerebrospinal fluid, you know, he's mentioning the cerebrospinal bringing the cerebrospinal fluid up into your, up into your brain, bathing the entire brain. Right. So, um, so imagine, right. That this fluid being this intermediary between the finite and infinite. And, um, there's a condensation of a less condensed energy form, sort of cosmic consciousness coming into body consciousness, it's spirit consciousness into body consciousness. And by breathing, we can create a rhythm in the fluid, kind of like an undulating process in this fluid, okay, um, that creates an oscillation. It brings vibration, some sort of energy frequency to the fluid, which can transmit this rhythm of light, the rhythm of the infinite, the rhythm of whatever is being transmitted. Um, is that a, a, a totally wacko hypothesis? Absolutely not. Absolutely no. not. And in fact, the people who are practicing this are probably are sensing this. Now what we need to do is, is, is create things that can actually measure it. Uh, and that's, that's what we're looking to do. Um, and so, you know, so we can get into a number of different ways that it moves, like we've talked about before, ultrasound, um, lights. So people are looking into ways of moving it. Um, what's interesting from a water perspective is again, the references of Yogananda and others to, uh, electricity, to an internal battery, to charging the internal battery. And, um, you know, could the, could the water of the cerebrospinal fluid actually be a major sort of internal battery, a major generator of that electricity where people are having these experiences of feels like an electrical bolt is going through me or coming out of my, coming out of my, uh, out of my head. Um, I'm having these visions, right. Of these really bright lights, whatever it might be. Um, and well, could there real quick, this, this kind of plays into, uh, the the possibility of um you know some yogis report not having to sleep and tibetan buddhists reporting not having to sleep and then also um the idea of breatharianism like if this is truly an internal battery that is becoming is its own power source converting life force energy into nourishment for the body that plays right into making breatharianism something that is real yep Sorry to interrupt, but I no, had to had to get that out. I think all those, you know, you're so spot on um, that it's like it's such, you know, it again, it's uh, it's it's just so great, right? To to get that, it's it's sort of like uh, again, it feels like you know, like a like a warm blanket being put on on all this sort of you know high tech science and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like wait, this this relates to this and this relates to this and this relates to this. And that actually makes sense from this perspective. And we, you know, you're connecting all the dots and that's exactly what, what, what we're doing for people who are, have had these experiences and they're like, God, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, they're scratching their heads or something like that. It's like, Oh my goodness, this makes perfect sense. And yeah. the number of emails that I get in that realm is like, you know, it's, it's tremendous. And so that's why we want to try to really get this kind of out there and, and people to have these experiences, but do them in a resourced perspective, right? Do them in a resourced way. Um, that's why I did the awakening awareness program, because it's like, even before I tell anybody to do anything with the cerebrospinal fluid, it's like, look, there's got to be some sort of resourcing that you, that, 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 that you need to be, um, that you need to be aware of that you need to have that, you know, regardless of what happens in a meditation, that you have a resource, that you have an anchor that you can go back to that makes you feel safe, that, that is grounding uh, for you, you know, whatever that is. And there's a, there's an, you know, there's an infinite number of resources that are out there. You just need to find the one that's, that works for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's this exploration that, you know, can occur and, and in doing so you can do it safely. 
uh, you know, without um, without overstimulating your system um, and and keeping it in what I call, you know, keeping it in your zone of tolerance mm -hmm. uh, or expanding your zone of tolerance so much that that you can hold anything. Um, and that's really the key. Wow. Um, so, yeah. You know, so again, it, it, could this be our internal battery, right? So if anybody's ever studied the fourth phase of water, that there's an exclusion zone, it's adjacent to hydrophilic surfaces was kind of the first, um, some of the first studies. And, you know, the cells that are in uh, the cells of the ventricles that are bathing the, uh, the, cerebrospinal, the cerebrospinal fluid are hydrophilic um, on their surface. So it's a perfect, uh, it, it is um, the same surface uh, and that and and could the cerebrospinal fluid under certain condition actually go into a fourth phase and form an exclusion zone when you have an exclusion zone you get the separation of of charges anytime you get a separation of charges now you have a, a, a potential for an internal energy source um and uh, again um if there's you know how could this actually be well there's some sort of energy that's put into the fluid uh, they they have shown this with things like infrared light, for instance, uh, that can that can induce a fourth phase. Um, could could uh, some energy go into the uh, cerebrospinal fluid and create this uh, exclusion zone that then uh, creates an output that's you know everything from uh, whenever we talk of energy, you know any sort of that this water in the cerebrospinal fluid has to be a transducer of energy. So you're looking at physiochemical energy, optical energy, electrical energy, mechanical energy, and radiant energy. Okay, so pretty powerful uh, as a as a hypothesis, and essentially that this can generate uh, an an uh, an electrical system. It could even light a light bulb. And that's maybe why we get to these images, right, where we see these bright lights, like the pick people, they, they draw this. Um, they have this sense of a bright light coming from within. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, it's this internal illumination. It's this internal in, in, enlightenment um, that, that, that we discuss. That's actually this activation of this internal battery. That's yeah. this activation of this internal system um, that is within us. And, 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 you know, maybe this is, maybe it's through the water that, um, that is actually being able to activate this, this internal, uh, this internal energy source. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, bringing it full circle, uh, you know, could the cerebrospinal fluid be this bridge, be this conduit, be this, uh, this, 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 you know, this fluid to transmit source cosmic consciousness, um, infinite potential, uh, spirit, whatever it might be that something that there's an energy transfer through the fluid being a less differentiated medium, um, that has this ability to, through the fluid, instantaneously affect all major areas of our spine and, and brain, um, and then and then and then be instantaneously dispersed through our whole body. So we're getting a whole body uh, synchronized, simultaneous uh, experience of the source cosmic consciousness, and that. It's not a one-way highway. It's not just a download, that there's a download and an upload, that this is constantly occurring, that there's a constant manifest on manifest, manifest on manifest, manifest on manifest that is occurring on a on, on, on you know on a split second basis. And we are having a relationship with it, whether we want to or not, or whether we are aware of it or not, mm -hmm. um, but that we could actually bring awareness to it and and be in relationship with it be in relationship with it and that is uh that to me is um is profound yeah um beyond profound <laughs> <laughs> by this whole episode i've just been had the biggest smile on my face like i'm a kid in a candy shop this is incredible incredible yeah so you know, it is, it, it is what it is. Like I like to say, um, 
you know, we, we can do what we, what we each wish to do with it. Um, there will be many more studies coming down the pipeline of what our cerebrospinal fluid is doing. Um, and, 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 you know, trying to understand it from a very subtle perspective, we've submitted a, a number of grants, um, that just seem to be too, uh, out there, I guess, for some people to fund, yeah. which is, which is, which is okay. Um, and again, you know, if the practice was any practice, the, you know, the practice is essentially to find your, you know, find a resource and that might take you a week. It might take you five years. It might take you 10 years, but in essence, you know, do a practice that finds your resource. And then slowly, slowly, you know, my whole goal is just bringing people's awareness to this fluid and, and opening up to it and mm -hmm. seeing what it does for, for them. Uh, and, 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 and that's it. There's nothing else besides that, right? It's sort of like you're just opening up to a different, to another dimension of pure anatomy and 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 physical body, and asking, just saying hello. Mm -hmm. And when you say hello in a resourced way, what happens? What do you notice? And if you are resourced, go with the flow. Go with the flow. <laughs> I love that. That holds such a deep meaning now. Go with the flow because it is really like this upward downward flow occurring with the cerebral spinal fluid. Wow, 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 wow. Oh, man. Mauro, this was one of my favorite episodes I've done in a while. And I don't say that lightly because I have some pretty incredible conversations with people. So, man, my wheels are just spinning and my heart feels on fire it's like the heart mind coherence that i'm experiencing because of this conversation that it, ah, it's the implications are incredible incredible and it's so cool that again you act as that perfect bridge between the the metaphysical and esoteric things that are, that are at play and then also the the hardcore analytical scientific um academic side of things and merge them together and it's it really is amazing to see someone dabble so well in both of those worlds and bring them together to coalesce to explain all of this. And it makes total sense. It's like, it's intuitive and, and, and it makes sense logically too. It's, it's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 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 So where, where can people find more of your work? I, I'll put it in the show notes, but it's always nice to have you share as well. Um, I, I, I have a web page. it's holdingspace.com. Uh, the majority of things from this work are really done on, uh, Instagram at Dr. Zapatera. Cool. Um, yeah. And then, you know, whatever, um, you know, people have emails or, uh, you know, they can reach me through Instagram if they have, uh, if they have questions or anything like that, or if they want to share their experience, uh, I am starting to take um, I am starting to, I thought of doing a book and then I, I realized that, um, more information is being, is being transferred over things like podcasts and YouTubes and stuff like that. And so, um, what I'm trying to do is just trying to get more people to, uh, who have had experiences with the CSF, um, where I'm interviewing them and just asking them, you know, what their experience was and, and, and where they're going from here. Great. Great. Well, thank you for being on the tip of the spear for something truly incredible. It was, it, it, it's fantastic. And this was such an awesome conversation. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me and, and, and great work and, and, uh, awesome, awesome stuff.